Welcome along to Point Blank Music School here in London. Uh, I'm Luke Hopper and I'm joined today in the studio by producer, engineer and Point Blank tutor Anthony Chapman uh, for this week's edition of Friday Forum Live. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, who haven't tuned in before, um, Friday Forum Live is your chance to get a bit of an insight into what we do here at Point Blank, to get a look behind the scenes really, um, and see what you can expect uh, from, from signing up to a course with us, from studying with us and uh, becoming part of our community. Um, so yeah, Anthony's here to um, give us a bit of an insight into um, Ableton Live, into parallel compression and uh, using drum racks within Ableton. Uh, we're also going to have a bit of an open forum here, so if you do have any questions, you know, make sure you get involved, post in the chat room, anything from the technical stuff, um, you know, what, what Anthony's going through, right the way up to, to, you know, general kind of point blank stuff or course info, anything like that, and uh, we'll do our best to, to kind of run through all the questions as we go. Um, so yeah, just before we, we jump into uh, the tutorial with, with Anthony, um, there's a couple of things just to let you guys know about. Um, at the moment, we have um, a free uh, reverse reverb device um, for Max for Live, which you can download via the Facebook page. Um, if you head to, to facebook.com, search for Point Blank, and then right on the top tab, you'll see a free Ableton plugin, and that is um, our brand new reverse um, reverb device. So um, well worth checking out. Uh, it's a free download as well. Uh, also, we have to say that uh, today is the very last day that you guys can get um, the music business course, the online course for half price. Um, so if you go over to, to pointblankonline.net, um, you should be able to see the course under music business courses and it's 50% for today only. Um, and the final thing to, to talk to you guys about is um, the, the next enrollment date for, for all online courses is December 10th. Uh, so if you are looking to, to jump on a course with us, then um, I'd recommend kind of starting the enrollment process as soon as you can really because they are getting quite full up. Um, so yeah, that, that's it from me for now. Um, as I say, keep posting in the chat room, get your questions in and I'll, I'll try my best to, to kind of get through them all as we go. Um, and I'll hand you over to Anthony. Thank you very much. Cheers. No problem. Um, so yeah, so as Luke says, what I'm going to look at today a bit is uh, parallel compression, specifically within the drum rack in uh, Ableton Live. There's a few features of the drum rack which I think aren't immediately obvious, particularly when you start using Live. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not so much hidden, but the defaults mean that you don't see stuff straight away. And parallel compression, and I think you, you've experienced this as well, is such a, a, a popular question topic. Mm -hmm. It's something that comes up all the time. Because I think people hear it talked about. And yeah, it's it a bit of a buzzword. Yeah, really. yeah. It, it sounds a bit mysterious. It kind of sounds like a, a bit of a magical mm -hmm. ingredient. And believe me, it can be really, really helpful and, and a really, really exciting technique. It's actually quite simple. Um, but it's, what I want to sort of show you is how we get that running within a drum rack in Ableton Live. And I'll sort of show you a way of getting it running on your entire track as well. Okay. Um, the other things I want to show you are um, using, creating sort of sends and returns within the drum rack and also getting those to come out into the mixer. Because again, I know back in the, the dim and distant past when I first started using live with the drum racks, I, I, I was kind of scratching my head for a while thinking, how do I do this and how yeah. do I get the signal to come out this way? And, and it's all there, it was just a case of sitting down with it mm. and, and, and finding those features. So I'm hoping I can you know, do some people Shines a favour right. yeah. and show yeah. them, uh, you know, get them to where it took me a little while to get. So, so cool. yeah, so shall I uh, yeah, head jump over into it. to live? Okay, so what I've got here is just a really simple kind of like 16 bar loop with uh, six tracks. Uh, so, you know, very, very simple, and I'll just quickly sort of uh, talk you through the different kind of uh, elements we've got here. So this is like the main uh, drum rack I've got here. So we can see the parts there, it's pretty, pretty standard, there's quite a lot going on, because I deliberately wanted to have something with quite a lot going on, uh, as it makes it easier to demonstrate parallel compression. Uh, so this is with all of my processing that I'm going to be showing you, this is with it applied, okay? 
But I've also got uh, another drum rack, which is the same, but without, without the same processing, okay? So if we just sort of A, B between those, so that's, that's the dry one, and that's the one with the processing. So straight away you can hear, once we've applied a bit of this processing, everything gets a lot sort of, a uh, lot more punchy, a lot more immediate, okay? So, uh, and then if we just look at the other little elements I've got going in here, uh, if I stop the clips. So just got a simple tambourine loop there as well. Um, and then sort of a little bit of white noise running through it, which of course is, you know, de rigueur these days. Yep. Everybody's running stuff like that through the tracks almost the whole time. Uh, when you actually stop and listen to stuff, it's amazing how, how much white noise there is running just like constantly through tracks. Uh, and then we've just got a little, little bass tone there and uh, mirroring the bass tone, I've got a little sort of synth bleep that's a bit higher up, which is up here. Okay, so this is a similar kind of uh, technique really to the to the what I was doing last week with the two drums. So I'm very deliberately running two things playing the same melody, focusing on different elements of it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's go back and look at the drums because this is the sort of this is really what we're mainly looking at today. So I've opened up the drum rack there, and uh, as you can see, what I've got running here, I've got as last week, uh, fat kick, top kick, fat snare, top snare. So uh, on each of those, if we listen, so we've got the fat kick, the top kick, the fat snare there, and then the top snare there. So that's the same, uh, exactly the same sort of approach as I was taking last week. That's so I wanted right. to kind of bring this in. Uh, now, what you'll see I've also got running here is a bunch of sends within the drum rack, okay? Now if I look at the device, you can see this section at the bottom here, this is brought up by clicking this R here, which brings up your return chains, okay? And what you can do there is you can drag and drop uh, any sort of plug-in or device into there. And I've named them, so I've got parallel, which is my parallel compression, uh, and I've got a reverb there as well, and then I've got these two external returns, and what I'm doing with those is I'm sending the audio out to the returns in the main mixer. So it across okay. the whole rack, is this? Uh, yeah, well, when you drop things into the return, when you drop things into the return chain area, it creates return channels within okay, the rack. Yeah, yeah. So, th that's, so that's these here on the right here, mm -hmm. okay? And then it also creates a send, which you use to drive that. So, so what I've done, if we look at the parallel compression, which is kind of the most important one I want to use, is I've create there's a send here, and each of these channels if I, send, if I send there, that comes up on this parallel compression return, okay? So that's kind of the architecture, and what I'll do in a minute is I'll go to the dry drum rack and I'll show, show you how that's actually created. Mm -hmm. But just to talk about what parallel compression actually is, it is mixing, uh, usually it's mixing a dry signal or a very, very lightly compressed signal with a, a compressed signal, often quite a heavily compressed signal, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so in this instance, if I show you on that parallel return there, I've got this uh, compressor running here, which is actually fairly, uh, fairly heavy. If, we, if, I, if I run that clip, let me bring that, that channel up. So, you know, it's compressing quite a lot. I think it's compressing by about sort of 8, 9 dB. I've got the threshold quite far back. And if, I, if we solo that, we can hear that on its own, okay? So that is just my compressed version of all of my drums in the rack. Now, what, what is really useful about doing it this way is because we're doing it with sends, we can dictate which parts of the drum rack go into the parallel compression. So for example, if I didn't want uh, my, the, the main hi-hat to go in there, I would just turn that down in the sense. So now everything else is going into my parallel compression, but not my hi-hat. Similarly, you know, if there was like, uh, uh, I've got this e extra snare there. So I've just now, I've just got the sort of main drums and yeah. that little yeah. thing yeah, yeah. as well. So that gives you a sort of extra 
extra kind of level of control over uh, what's going into the parallel compression, okay? Uh, I hope this is making sense for people. I don't yeah. know if anybody's uh, if anyone's we've got, asking To be any honest, questions. we've just got a lot of uh, shout outs, really. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, people locked in from, from Dublin, from Portugal, from Trinidad in the Caribbean, wow. uh, Amsterdam, uh, a rainy Corfu. Oh. Uh, yeah, so international uh, crew. Uh, but yeah, no questions yet. If you do come up with anything, guys, you know, just, just post in the chat room and we'll, and we'll answer as we go. Cool. Uh, yeah. No worries. So, so, that's, so that's my parallel compression bus there. Um, now, I've also got a, a little reverb return within the drum rack. So I just wanted to show you. Uh, we can do this within the drum rack. So I wanted to show you like a reverb return within the drum rack and one out in the main mixer as well. Okay, okay so uh, if we just have a listen here, if I just play that clip again. So it's quite faint, but that's, so that's just one I'm running off the snare within the, within the drum rack, okay? So that's just like a, a, a real small sort of detail, but it gives me that sort of control. I see a lot of students who, um, to get reverb running uh, on their tracks in the drum rack, they'll resort to dropping a reverb plug-in into the individual track in the drum rack, mm -hmm. which will work, but it's not ideal because you have to then balance the dry and the wet signal in the plug-in. Okay, right, it's yeah, not as yeah. controllable. Yeah. Also, it, if your computer's not really powerful. Reverbs are actually, you know, one of the big sort of yeah, resource yeah. hogs on a computer. So if you start dropping reverbs in on, mm. on loads of different channels, um, it's really going to like eat into your CPU. Yeah, yeah. I also think that um, I personally like to minimise the number of different reverbs I use because mm -hmm. I kind of think when we use reverb, we're trying to put things into a space. Mm. And it's better they're all in the same space, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe like one or two or yeah. three maybe spaces. I think spaces. when I work, I tend to have two, one short, one long. It's exactly, yeah. It, yeah. And it's just, and I also think they sound a bit better. When you mix mm. a bunch of sources going into the reverb, I think that actually sounds better yeah. than when you have it yeah, on yeah. individual inserts. So, um, I've yeah. got a quick question, mm. question actually, Anthony. Um, Someone, uh, a regular viewer actually, Wolf Pyro Man, has asked, uh, "What are the actual benefits of using parallel?" Compression? That is a really good question, and I should have. I should, <laughs> thank you, Wolf. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wolf, uh, Wolf, Wolf Pyro, Pyro Man, Man. Thank yeah. you very much for picking me up on my uh, uh, leaving that out. So the, the the benefits of parallel compression are um, if you've got something that dynamically kind of changes from. Uh, um, you know, very heavy sort of stuff, just kind of light stuff. One of the benefits of it is that when it changes between those different moods, mm -hmm. the, the kind of, the, the gulf between them is reduced. So okay. um, when something's really slamming, you know, the parallel compression channel is gonna mm -hmm. make itself very obvious and you're gonna get that really compressed vibe. Because we all know what it's like when you drop a compressor in on something and you start to wind it on, you go, yeah, that yeah, sounds yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And it's really tempting to just really crank yeah, it. Yeah. But of course, when you really crank it, you start to lose all those transients, mm. and on drums, that is a that's a that's a disaster. Yeah. So, um, so parallel compression can be used to maintain the transients on your drums, but also give it that urgent sort mm. of slamming uh, character. Um, similarly, if the whole track breaks down, yep. that parallel compression is going to ease off. So, if it broke down to just like hi hats or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that parallel compression will ease off. It's and not going to be a, a dramatic bit. difference. Exactly, it it will balance everything out a little bit. It just mainly though, it just sounds really good. Yeah. It's, it's just a nice yeah. kind of uh, very kind of sort of immediate sort of sound mm. and by no means is it only something that you should only use on drums. Mm -hmm. um, parallel, I first became aware of parallel compression uh, being used in classical music, in like okay. orchestral recordings. Apparently it's, that's a very, very popular use of it right. because if you think about an orchestral sort of recording, it will go from There's really, lot, really quiet yeah, yeah. to like bang, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and you can't just slap a big compressor yeah, over yeah, it because yeah. the whole thing will just get squashed. So it gives it that kind of, you know, uh, it evens everything out yeah. a little bit and gives it an exciting sort of character. But basically, yeah, that, I think the main, the main benefit of using parallel compression is to be able to get the character, the sonic character of something uh, really, really uh, compressed mm -hmm. without losing sort of the transients and the kind of, you know, the real useful, uh, useful sort of end of stuff. Yeah. So I hope that explains I it a little bit. I think that's a pretty good explanation. Um, I better just say, uh, guys, if you are experiencing um, a slightly kind of in and out picture, there's a couple of uh, technical issues, but it should be sorted any second. I've seen a couple of people posting in there. Um, so yeah, don't, don't really mind too much about that. We, we will get it fixed ASAP. Um, 
Joe has asked, um, do you use different attack and release settings when using parallel compression than you would normally, uh, than you normally would as an insert? Uh, usually, yes, uh, particularly with drums. Um, so if I was just uh, compressing the drums bus, let's say, remember last week I was saying that I'm, I believe that a lot of people, you know, when you use sampled uh, drums, particularly from sampled libraries, you don't need to slap loads of compression yeah, and yeah. stuff on because it's already been done. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I'm compressing the drums bus, I'll keep the attack fairly slow because I want those transients to yeah. still make yeah, it yeah, through. Yeah. But with parallel compression, often I'm, I'm approaching it in a different way and I really want it to sound compressed. Mm -hmm. I kind of want that that initial, you know, when you put a compressor on, you wind up and go, yeah, that sounds yeah, really, yeah, yeah. that sounds so cool. But I want that so that we can mix that with the dry signal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, often I would use, uh, I think in this one, I've probably used fairly fast attack. Uh, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm under like one millisecond uh, attack uh, in this one. So that, so that means, you know, um, it's basically saying, the dry stuff can do all of the transient work. All of the transients will poke through from the drier stuff, but the parallel compression is there to just be really slammed mm -hmm. and to kind of mix it in with everything else. Okay. Um, I think we've got a couple more. Um, Groovin, Groove Nuts, great name, <laughs> has asked, um, could this type of compression be used after the mix down process or is it, um, I mean, maybe before or is it more effective after? It depends what kind of, uh, uh, it depends whereabouts you're applying it. Mm -hmm. So on the drum stuff, I would really want to be doing this in the mix. Yeah. So as you saw, the way I use the sends, I like to have that control. So mm -hmm. I don't parallel, I don't put everything in parallel compression if I don't yeah, want to, yeah. you know. Because sometimes what you might find is if you really slam everything into parallel compression, if there's crash cymbals and stuff like that, you might notice them kind of, wow sort of yeah, like yeah. pumping a little bit, which sometimes is good, but it might not fit right. with the track. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, sometimes I use, um, I will use parallel compression on an entire mix sometimes, a mm. bit of it, uh, and that could either be in the mix or it could be at a kind of either mastering or a pre-mastering mm. stage. So yeah, you could do it, but okay. you've just got to be aware that um, when you're doing parallel compression on, on, a, on like a much bigger section of the mix or the whole mix, mm -hmm. you kind of have to be the, the more the, here's the way I look at it: the more stuff that's going into that parallel parallel compression bus, the more careful you have to be yeah, about yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. Again, just be careful. And I, I, and when I say this stuff, it's not because I'm so great and I've never done yeah. it. I say it because I've done it all. You sit there and you crank it up and you you get so vibed out on it. And then, <laughs> and then the next you then you go home and you listen to the track the next morning and you're like, oh, what have I done? Like, I've just completely <laughs> overcooked it. So yeah, so you just Subtle think about it. Good, exactly, guess, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Is um, okay. I think you kind of answered that. The influence asked if uh, parallel compression is to be added only on the drums or the whole track. You kind of said sometimes. Yeah, could, yeah. could be either. In this instance, um, at the moment, it's just on the drum rack, but it totally, you know, it totally, totally could, could be on yeah, the whole track. Yeah, I think experimenting with it again, yeah. we spoke about before. Absolutely. Um, let's have a look. Um, Matt, Matthew's asked, um, have you got a tip on how much um, do we have to compress high frequencies like hi-hat or snare, the parameters of the compressor? Um, as soon as I compress them, it gets so snappy that it hurts my ears. <laughs> <laughs> that sound, well, it w obviously I'm saying all this without hearing the yeah, sounds that yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. compressing, but it would kind of depend on the attack. Um, it could be that you are, you are compressing it with a really fast attack mm -hmm. and then turning the volume up in response. Yeah, and that's okay. making it go tick, 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 yeah, tick, yeah, like yeah. really, really snappy. Um, as I said, I mean, this for me, this is a really handy thing because I can control the level of the, the high. So as I did in, in live, I turned the send down on the hats yeah. there going into my parallel compression. So I can sort of like uh, turn that down. Now, again, going back to my sort of hobby horse of uh, watching out for compressing sort of sample drums mm -hmm. and stuff like that, um, it really depends. Uh, whether if you're gonna if you're gonna compress like a, a hi hat on its own, yeah. does it really need it? This yeah, is, yeah, this is what yeah. I would be thinking because if it's playing the same velocity every time, mm. then is it really gonna need it? If it's the same sample played every time, mm. um, 
uh, if it's just a single hi hat here, you know, there's just nothing there really to compress other than the transient, you know. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. It's, yeah. Um, so just be watch out for the uh, the attack and try mm. uh, putting everything through a bus and compressing that mm -hmm. rather than than the individual the individual. Yeah, sounds. I think compressed the drums as a whole is probably going to yeah, make yeah. a difference. I mean, with loops that. That is a whole different kettle of fish. You know, you mm. can get a lot of exciting stuff going with compression loops, but the thing yeah, is, that's yeah, a collection yeah. of lots yeah. of different sounds. Yeah. It's already been mixed, so you know, yeah. Um, okay, it looks like um, Harvey's asked again about the whole mix. Um, so yeah, you know that there can be occasions yeah, when it's called for. Absolutely, definitely. absolutely. Um, Parallel limiting as well sometimes uh, it can can work in mastering and stuff like that. So okay. yeah. So um, let's let's jump back into live yeah. for a second and uh, keep the questions coming, guys, and we'll um, we'll go we'll answer them as we go. No problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to kind of show you how I put this together. So I'm going to close up my uh, drum rack, which has all the processing on it, and I'm going to use this dry one here. Okay. So this is kind of like uh, a standard drum rack. This is kind of like what you would see. Okay. Um, so if I just play that, we can hear, we've got the standard drums, I mean it sounds pretty good but I just want to give it some more life, okay. Uh, I haven't got any sends running uh, in, within the drum rack. So what I'm going to do first is come down to this bottom left section of the drum rack and click the R to bring up the, the return chains area, okay. And you can see it says here, drop audio effects here. So the first thing I'm going to do is my parallel compression. So to do that, I'm going to go up to the, uh, the devices and I'm going to drag a compressor down into there. By the way, you'll notice today I'm using all uh, factory plugins mm -hmm. from Live, so anybody who has Live should be able to do this. Um, so I've dropped that compressor into the return chains area, and as you can see, on my ch individual channels in the drum rack, uh, we've now got a send. Now, so we've now got send A, okay? Now, what you need to look at on the return chain here is the output of the return chain. Uh, so it's sending audio to the rack output, okay? So what this means is the audio of this return chain is contained within the drum rack, and so that will come out with everything else on that main drum rack fader, which is this one here, okay? Now, you can change that to uh, route to any ret return tracks you've got in the mixer. So this is how I would create a send in my drum rack that feeds to my main reverb. So um, if I uh, create a return chain, so I right click in that space there, I create a return chain, and I'm gonna call that uh, external, if I can spell it, external reverb. So now I've got a parallel compression return, and this is my external reverb, which I'm gonna root out to my reverb that's in the mixer. Okay, so that's return A, which is this one over here, which just has the main hall reverb on it. Okay, so what I need to do now is um, I need to get my drum sounds going into the parallel compression. So to do that, I need to use send A, because this is uh, A here, and I'm gonna do this in a sort of uh, quick and dirty way. Basically, I'm just gonna go through all of my channels and I'm gonna set them all to zero dB, to unity, okay? So that's just means it will be the same level uh, as what is coming from the fader, okay? So now if I play this, you play that clip. And if I solo my compression bus, so this is my parallel compression bus, okay? So I'm gonna come down here, and I'm really gonna drive that hard. What you'll notice is if you set your attack and release quick enough, you will actually hear it start to distort. Yeah. It's because the attack and the release is triggering so quickly. If you imagine it being like a sort of sawtooth, it is actually physically distorting it. Um, a little bit of that can be okay, but you know. Uh, now what I'm gonna do as well is, I'm gonna take out the crash symbol yeah. from that, because that's, that's kind of getting a bit, a bit sort of uh, washy and a bit pumpy. So you see, I've taken that out. Remember, we're only listening to my sort of compression bus. Uh, I'm gonna pull the hi-hat down a little bit. And that, that little disco percussion thing, 
I'm going to bring that down. So mainly I want to concentrate on the kick, the snare, and that I've also, I don't, if you've noticed, I've got this, I've got this like vinyl hat. It's just a little hi hat with uh, some record scratching off it. I've looped it up in the in the simpler, and that just fills everything out a little bit. So if I take my parallel compression out, that's the sort of raw output of the drum rack. If I put it back in, you can already hear how much sort of like punch that can bring into it. And then if I go onto my sort of snares here, and I use that send B, that send B is gonna send it out to the main uh, reverb in my mixer. Probably isn't like the best reverb for a snare drum, but you know, it's there, we've got it going there. Okay? And then, sort of lastly on this little bit, I will also, uh, let me just grab a reverb and then put a reverb within the drum rack. Okay, so this is something that I've been doing in the, uh, um, in the, the drum rack that's got the effects on it. Uh, so that one is gonna go to the rack output and so on this return here, I've got my reverb there. I'm going to make sure that's 100% wet. This is something to watch out for because a lot of the presets in live uh, mm -hmm. for reverb aren't set to 100% wet. Okay. So um, because this is a return, yeah, yeah. I want it 100% wet because I don't want any of the dry signal coming through. Mm -hmm. It is something that bugs me, I have to say. <laughs> um, I, I, I think all, they should all be 100% wet and you can dial them back if you need to. Yeah. But that, you yeah. know. Uh, I think I'm just, uh, maybe I'm a bit old school, you know. Uh, so, so if I run that, so if I now use send C, so that's again, we've got our, uh, our own little reverb within the, within the drum rack as well. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I started to, to put the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. um, and all these little bits to do with the return chain, you know, once you do it, it is, it's obvious. Yeah. Um, but I honestly found when I, you know, when I was a novice live user, it was something I would hit again and again. The drum rack for me was one of the most exciting mm -hmm. bits of, of live. I really love, love the way it's kind of laid out. It's yeah, so easy yeah, to use. Yeah. But then I would, I would get so far with it and I would think, oh, but I really want to be able to integrate it into the rest of the mixer properly. Mm -hmm. And it, honestly, it just took me ages and then somebody said, oh, you do this. And, and as soon as you, you open up that return chain area, it's like, oh, oh, okay. And, and it all starts to, to open up. This on yeah, and that's yeah. Just, I guess I just want, I want to try and help people kind of, you know, think about using it in a, in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, you know, I often see student projects with six or seven reverbs yeah. dropped in yeah. on the individual channels of the drum rack. And it's like, you know, <laughs> we need to kind of sort that out. Let's, yeah. let's, let's rationalize this a little bit. Yeah. And, they're often, and, and often the, only, the reason I see it is because they're saying, oh, my, the, you know, the CPU's overloaded, my computer's really struggling. So they're saying, what's wrong with it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have a look and, I, and, I, and it's good because it means I can show them, oh, if we can rationalize all these down into one reverb, mm -hmm. then they get so much power back. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's, um, it's really going to be quite useful for a lot of people. I mean, we've got uh, lots of guys, I think, who um, haven't um, kind of used this, this kind of technique before. Cool. Um, so let's have a look. Um, so yeah, exactly. So um, Zigula has said, um, so you send the instruments you want to the parallel compression bus instead of dropping compressors on each track. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, um, yeah. So yeah, and the reason I use the send in the drum rack is because um, uh, I can control the level mm -hmm. of the individual uh, parts that are going to the parallel compression. There are other ways of doing this. I mean, for example, there, there would be nothing to stop me uh, making a return track, and this is kind of how I would do a bit of parallel compression on the whole mix. I might be able to demonstrate okay. that in a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah. I would make a return track and then uh, put all of my sends mm -hmm. uh, on the individual tracks in the mixer to you know to zero, so they're all going at the same level as the the faders. Yeah. And then put a, com a compressor on that, and then balance that up as my parallel compression for the whole mix. Okay. 
So that there's nothing to stop you doing that on the drum rack. Mm -hmm. You could just you you know you could do it outside the drum rack. You, you could do it inside the drum rack like I had there and have all the sends at zero. But I like to have that flexibility because as yeah, we could yeah, hear, yeah. for example, the crash cymbal is like oh that doesn't really need to get slammed so hard in the parallel. You want to pull it back a little yeah, bit. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's nice to have that control. And what would be um, you know just speaking from um, you know a novice perspective, what is the the benefit of using like parallel compression on the whole mix? Uh, on the whole mix, it's kind of the same as I was saying before. It really, it's it's uh, the the differences between the loud passages and the quiet passages mm -hmm. will be smoothed out a little bit, but not in as blatant yeah. or as as kind of ungainly a way as if you just slap a compressor across everything mm -hmm. and and just leave it running. Mm -hmm. That said, I do always compress my. I am compressing this yeah. mix a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do always do it a little bit, but I just try to do it quite gently. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about mix bus compression is that um, really you should mix into it um, but the, the, the key is working out the time at which you put the, the, the compressor across the master. Okay. So the way I tend to work on a mix is once I've got my drums up and I've got an idea of the, of the level that mm. the drums are going to be at and that gives you a good idea of what the level of the track is going to be, yeah. then I drop my compressor in on the master okay. and then I carry on mixing into that. Yeah, and I always yeah, try to yeah, keep yeah. an eye on it that I'm not slamming yeah, it too yeah. hard um, because if you do a mix and you've got automation in the mix and you do all other effects mm -hmm. and then at the end you go, oh, I've finished my mix and now I'm going to put a compressor over it that's going to change yeah. the character, yeah, and especially yeah. automation yeah. is going to... Is you have to go back and do it all. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So you've, yeah. got to, you've got to get it in quite early. But yeah, but absolutely, parallel compression is a valid uh, thing to use in, in, in that instance as well. Okay, cool. Um, let's just have a quick um, look through the chat room. Um, <clears throat> okay, does it... Uh, Funk Master Buzz has asked... Uh, uh, does it not cause phasing if you don't put the compression onto a different setting, i.e. FF1 or look ahead? Uh, this is a really good question. This is a really, really good question. It can. Um, it's, it, it depends on, yes, indeed, it does depend on uh, which, um, which setting you use. Look ahead can cause a problem. Mm -hmm. So just in case anybody's wondering, so look ahead is a, is a setting in the, the, the factory compressor in live and I think the gates have it as well. And lots of other software have plugins where I've look ahead. It's basically, you turn on look ahead and in, in here we can say uh, on, on pretty much any of the compressors, you've got a value there of look ahead. It can be zero milliseconds, one milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, okay? Um, and basically that means it goes ahead in the timeline and looks at what's coming up. Now, obviously, okay. when you turn on look ahead, that causes a delay because if you think about it, if you turn on right. 10 milliseconds yeah, look yeah, ahead, yeah. you have to be hearing everything late yeah, for it yeah, to work. Yeah. Um, so it can cause uh, phase problems. I tend to find that I leave it on leave it on one millisecond look ahead and it seems okay. to be okay it's not phasing at the moment i will say some devices in live um do cause it more than others mm -hmm. uh, i mean i was experimenting last night with using the saturator and the overdrive to do a kind of bit of saturation on everything mm -hmm. and i was finding that they were causing phase problems okay. so there's probably something that they're doing uh which you know you can get around it, but mm. I just thought I didn't. I didn't want to go so insanely yeah. <laughs> deep into it today. You know. So with the look ahead, it's it keep the keep the time very very short. Yeah, if yeah. you can keep it on the on the one millisecond setting, in my experience, it's usually fine. Again, okay. I'm to, to, this is with the factory compressor in in live, it, but it, it does tend to be okay. If you put it on ten, then you can get you can get problems. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, Okay, oh, I've quite a few coming in. Um, please recommend what compressor compressors, in your opinion, are best for drums, for basses, for synths, and for for the whole mix. Okay. Anything in particular? Well, okay. Um, well, big I, question. I have. Well, first off, I should say I think the factory compressor in in live is really good. Mm -hmm. It's really really good. Um, it's tough because it doesn't look very exciting because it's just yeah. a generic device. Yeah, yeah. So we get we kind of get fooled a little bit into thinking that it isn't a great compressor, but mm. I think it's very good, you know, especially when you sidechain stuff. Everybody mm. knows one of the great, one of the genius moves of Ableton was building sidechaining yeah, so easily definitely. into it. 
Um, I know when I, you know, when I, that was first demoed to me, my eyes kind of mm. widened. I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is going to make life so much easier. Um, but I think the, the compressor in, in, uh, in, in live is great. Um, third party stuff. I'm a huge fan of uh, the IK Multimedia Black 76, which mm -hmm. is the IK's uh, emulation of the Yuri 1176. Uh, that is a fantastic compressor. I would kind of use that on it, on it, everything, and I usually do yeah. on my tracks. The thing I like about that, though, is that it, it models the amp stage of the compressor. So even if you're not compressing, when you turn it on, it sounds different, okay. which is what you want for something when it's modeling this bit of analog gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other than that, core, cool. what other ones do we use? Oh, well, funnily enough, one, one that I do really like is the glue okay. and, uh, by Cytomic, and Live 9 is going to come with that included. Right. Okay. So uh, they've made a new device just called the glue. So it doesn't use the, the interface that the glue, the third party version uses. It's got Ableton's own. Exactly. Device, yeah. But it's quite nice. They've got like a sort of VU on it. Okay. And the idea behind that is that it's um, really good for sort of bus compression, so mm -hmm. for drums or for the whole mix. And I think. Uh, I believe it's modelled on an SSL bus okay. compressor that you get in a lot of those big SSL mixers. Yeah. And I know that back in the days of uh, using big studios and big analog desks and having to hire gear in, mm -hmm. a lot of the time in the sort of late nineties, early two thousands, clients that I was working with would say, "We want the SSL bus compressor." So I would always be on the phone to hire <laughs> companies yeah. saying, "Have you got a SSL bus compressor? Because we need one right now. Like it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but, you know, we really need one." So um, yeah, that's really good. Uh, oh, there's loads out there. Uh, Waves, our compressor, I mm -hmm. think is really nice, you know. Uh, but honestly, don't feel like you have to run out and, uh, and, and, and buy stuff because I think um, the, the, the stuff in live is great, mm. you know. And as and you said, Live 9, it's going to have... Yeah, to, that's yeah. going to have... The, that glue compressor is going to be mm. fantastic. So uh, I'm really, really excited to try that. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, the, but the, 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 they mentioned bass. Mm. The, yeah, that, the Black 76, the IK okay. one. I know... Unfortunately, we we're about a week late. I know last week they had it. They were selling it for about twenty-five pounds. So oh, they had really? a special on. IK often have specials. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, be like me and sort of, you know, a, a bit tight. <laughs> keep, an eye, keep an eye on things when they're cheap. So. <laughs> okay, let's have a quick look. Um, Wolf Pyroman is, is back asking another one. Um, can um, parallel compression make a bass more subby or give it more body? Yes, it absolutely could. Um, if it depends on the character of the bass that you're mm -hmm. feeding into it, but if what you're finding is that, um, so say you've got a bass sound that is uh, quite full, there's quite a lot of sort of growl at the top end, you've got quite a lot of sub, but what you might find is that if you think, oh, I like the growl, and you try and EQ up the growl, but it kind of, you lose the definition of the sub. You go, mm -hmm. okay, I'll EQ up the sub, but then you lose the definition of the growl. Yeah. What you could yeah, do with yeah. parallel compression would be say, okay, let's look at the sort of how dynamic it is at the bottom end and then maybe feed, uh, you know, split it into the two buses using like the technique I've got here yeah. and then just treat one side, you know, wind a bit of top end off it, really like hype up the, the bottom end uh, a bit uh, mm -hmm. and then do that pre-compression, that can totally help. And so what you can end up with is the, okay. the, the sub end just being kind of nailed and really like flattened mm -hmm. uh, so it's really consistent but letting the, letting the top end just sort of do do its thing, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. So yeah, no, absolutely, you can totally do that. Okay, very good advice. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, okay, Mark. Uh, no, sorry, not Mark. Um, Groove Nuts again has asked, um, how would you mix down the drums after you finish with them? For example, uh, would you try and glue them together with the rest of the track via another compressor? Okay. Um, well, I can it. actually demonstrate. Yeah, that let's go a little for bit it. Here. So. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my original one. I've shown you how we made the, uh, the parallel compression, the external reverb and the sort of reverb within the drum rack. So I'm just going to close that one down and we'll go back to the, the, the original one, which is the one that had the effects on that I prepared already. Okay. Now, if we, uh, look at the, if we look at the, the, dr the whole drum rack, I'm going to, I'm just going to hide, uh, some of this so it's a little bit easier to see. So this is my drum rack here. But as you can see, yes indeed, I am compressing it a little bit. Um, I'm using this mix gel setting, which is a preset in live that's quite gentle, quite slow, 
Um, I mean, you can wind that on quite a lot. And it's got quite a slow release. It's got over a, a second release. So it, 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 you've got to be careful that you're not killing all the sort of the dynamics. Yeah. But um, yeah. it is quite nice. And interestingly, I'm uh, also using that on the, on the master as well. So everything is being compressed through that as well. Now, what you'll notice is that I try to do... The way I kind of look at it is I try to do lots of little amounts of compression. Mm -hmm. On the parallel compression, that's different. I will like slam that, you know, yeah, really, really yeah, yeah, slam it. Yeah. But when I'm doing my compression sort of across the mix or on buses, what I tend to try to do is a little bit here, mm -hmm. a little bit there, and everything kind of sort of starts to get tamed and taken yeah. under control. Um, as I said, you know, it's something I keep coming back to, just resist the urge to go crazy yeah. with it because it sounds exciting. I know it sounds exciting, but um, especially with, you know, electronic music like we're looking at here, um, the transients can get lost and then mm. that is it. Your track is dead yeah, yeah. because somebody will play it on a big system and if there's no transient like punch or knock, mm -hmm. is, that's it, you know, forget it. Um, but yeah, so on the drum rack there, uh, got the mixed gel compressor and a little bit of EQ because I, after I'd done all of my funny business with parallel compression and, and the compression, I just thought, needs a little bit of help at the top end, needs a little bit of help at the bottom end. And you know, I mean, in terms of uh, sort of overall kind of balance and sound, that's pretty good. If I sort of start to bring in the hi-hat there, the, well, the hi-hat, the tambourine, sorry. And so we can see another little bit of kind of uh, related processing that I'm doing on the tambourine there, which is kind of two stages of compression, okay? So I'm using the first stage of compression here, if I solo this, I'll turn off the second one. So obviously the tambourine, this sample, is when it's the hit on the hand, mm -hmm. it's very loud, yeah. but the little shook bits are quite quiet. So I'm using this compression to even out the level between okay. those two bits, to sort of smooth it out a bit. But then I'm side chaining it from the drum rack as well. Right. So I've already sort of reduced that dynamic range a little bit, then I want it to pump a little bit based on the drum rack, so mm -hmm. I can let the drums sort of breathe a bit. Um, and again, like I did last week, I'm EQing that down a bit. Rather than just doing it off the kick drum, mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing it off the whole drum rack. But there's, you know, you, you absolutely could do it uh, just straight off the off the kick drum uh, from the drum rack. I could set up a send. Yeah, we've actually got a question. Um, Andy Stone has asked uh, how to use sidechain, um, you know, whilst using how to sidechain whilst using parallel compression. Um, uh, are we you? Are we using like every single channel with single compression or, or in a different way? Okay, so, um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll sort of just demo what's going on here yeah. and like a different yeah. way of approaching it as well. So, um, so again, if I run these uh, clips again, so we've got, this is just my drums and my tambourine, okay? And so as I was saying, this is a side chain on the tambourine which is uh, being fed by the entire drum rack, which I have, if we, which I've EQ'd down. So it's mainly the bottom end and a bit of the snare. Okay, but there's different there's different ways I could approach that. Um, so let's say I did just want to uh, side chain it only off the kick drum. Yeah. Okay. So so what I'm going to do is go to my drum rack, and I am going to uh, make another return chain. Okay, so I'm going to create a return chain. Okay, and I'm just I'm going to call that side chain. Okay, so and then what I'm going to do here is uh, I need to make another return in my uh, mixer. So if I make a return track, and I'm going to call that side chain. Okay, and. Uh, so if I go back into my drum rack here, so it's this E, so send E, let's say I just want to send my kick to that. So I'm going to send it both sides of the kick, the top kick and the fat kick, okay? And I'm going to send that to my side chain track in the mixer. So you can see it here, everything's getting a bit slammed at the moment. Okay, so this is my side chain reference here now. Uh, so, if I go to the tambourine, 
and I set my uh, sidechain reference here to the sidechain return C. If I turn this down. So now, so now that is only being uh, sidechained by the kick drum from the drum rack. Yeah. So sort of as they were asking, yeah, th th this is just showing you there's different different ways of of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I said, my, uh, often my preference is to use kind of a mix uh, of the whole drum track yeah, for yeah, side chaining. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, but it depends because, you know, as I said last week, a lot of the stuff I do tends to be a bit break -y, uh mm -hmm. I mean, I'm from that background, so even yeah, when it's yeah. stuff like this is housey, it's full sound. but it's got a lot going on. I like a lot of percussive stuff going mm -hmm. on. But if I was doing something that was a lot more banging, kind of techy, yeah. then I would probably think about just using the kick drum or mm -hmm. What I often do, I know the remix I had up last week, uh, I have a track which is just a kick drum sample yeah. on quarter notes, which I've just duplicated to the whole track. Mm -hmm. And I've got that turned down in the mix, but I use that as a sort of uh, side chain, like, you know, uh, key yeah, for yeah, everything. Yeah. So that means that even if you break down to a track and you've got, say, you've got a pad, I can just feed it a side chain from that. Yeah, even though the so kick drum's not playing pump. out, it will still pump. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that's kind of how I would approach that. Um, Cool, we've got, um, we are kind of approaching time, but we've got a question from um, Zikula who's asked, do you always use peak mode for parallel compression? If so, why, or what about opto or RMS? Ooh, yeah, um, peak mode usually will be what I go to because I kind of want a, a, a quite a, a, a fast response and I kind of want to, peak mode for me on the live compressor is usually the um, the most controllable, mm -hmm. uh, the most immediate of the modes. Uh, opto mode is a lot smoother. So maybe if I didn't want as like punchy a kind mm. of sound, I would try opto. RMS, that's a very different beast because that's, that's basically, um, uh, oh God! Now at ten, at ten to two, this is it's probably not the time to start going into <laughs> R, what RMS is. But RMS is just a different way of measuring loudness okay. of uh, that's that's kind of, kind of an average rather right. than like a peak is at any moment you measure yeah, the loudness yeah, that yeah. is your peak. Yeah. Whereas RMS is like averaged out over a period okay. of time. And RMS mode is good for compressing the mix, you know, for sort of smooth, mellower sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I tend to use uh, peak. But there's no reason why, particularly opto, if you've yeah. got something where smooth smoothness works, then use opto, absolutely. Okay, okay um, good stuff. Um, Funk Master Buzz has asked, with parallel compression, uh, is it better to set the attack to let the snap through before it gets slammed and just send the snap back into the original drum track mix? Okay, um, it, it, it is a matter of preference. Okay. And my preference is for... Uh, if we're dealing with any kind of um, sort of dance music or rock music, pop music, I mean, I mix a lot of uh, rock music, and mm. I use parallel compression uh, when I'm mixing rock music. Yeah, as we well. talked about that last time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I use parallel compression on the drums, mm -hmm. like absolutely. You know, yeah. it, it, I couldn't I couldn't do it without it. You know, yeah, it's a yeah, very yeah, modern yeah. sound, and what I tend to do is. Um, my parallel compression brushing won't just be compression; it will be really saturated, quite distorted as mm -hmm. well. But you can bring that up behind the drum kit okay. and just give it so much life. Mm. But because that's the kind of way I work and it's a similar way in, in dance music, I like to um, kind of let the transients come through from the, from the original drums and my parallel compression bus, I will tend to set with really fast attack so that the, the transients okay. get a bit caught by that. Um, that's because I like to think of that as my two balances. Again, it's all kind of related to yeah, the drum layering yeah, for last week. Yeah. I like the top, the top kick to give it the snap and the transient mm -hmm. and the, the, the sort of deep, the fat kick to give it the body. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a similar sort of thing with parallel compression. The dry tracks are going to be my kind of transient snap yep. and the parallel compression bus is kind of going to be my body. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay, okay, cool. Um, just a couple more guys as we are getting to the end of the session. Um, the Y Crone has asked, uh, what is the maximum value of gain reduction we would allow on the master bus compression? Um, and is this any different in parallel or in normal compression? Uh, it is different, yeah. Um, I mean, I can't really put a figure on it because obviously it depends on the yeah, character of the track, yeah. but I would almost always err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. So it, in a typical modern mix of mine, I would be aiming to be compressing by 
no more than like sort of three dB, three or four dB on the okay. on the master bus, so not a huge amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it would be different if I was, for example, working in an analog studio with you know vintage kind of gear. That's different because you, if you've got like a big old optical valve compressor uh, on the mix, you can mm -hmm. really really cane that. Mm -hmm. But um, in, when I'm mixing in the box, not a huge amount. Parallel compression. I mean, if we look, yeah, if we look back at um, we look back at our parallel compression here, I mean, uh, let's have a look, where is it? So yeah, this is pretty heavy, you know. I think this is this is around sort of 8 dB, something like that. So that's quite a lot, but you could, you know, you can really, really go for it with parallel compression. This is basically, this questioner has kind of hit the kind of nub of yeah. the issue of parallel compression, is this is what we use it for. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we love that compressed sound, mm -hmm. but we want to be able to have that compressed sound and still have our clarity mm -hmm. and punch of the, yeah. of the dry sound as well, and this lets us balance between the, the two. Parallel compression is the, the kind of, the tool to balance it then. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and it's, you know, we, we all love uh, the sound of compression. Yeah? Mm. Our ears yeah, compress yeah. stuff yeah, naturally yeah. anyway, but we always love that, that kind of the sound, you know, mm. and uh, I mean, Joe Meek in the 60s, who, you know, had his, he, he was kind of the, one of the first independent record producers. He had his studio just up the road in Holloway. Mm -hmm. And he kind of, he almost kind of invented a lot of what we do now in compression, you know, he, okay. and, 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 and he was right. He was spot on that, you know, people really like that sound. Yeah. It sounds good. We want, yeah, we yeah. want that, you know, yeah. we, we, we want a bit of that. Certainly in pop music and rock mm -hmm. music, anything that's kind of strident and loud, mm -hmm. you know, we, we want that. Obviously, I wouldn't expect classical music to be completely like yeah. slammed or yeah, anything yeah, like yeah. that. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Never know. Like this. Yeah, well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> All right, well, I guess um, it's a pretty uh, good note to end on. Um, thanks to all you guys for, for tuning in, um, for, for watching with us today. If you do kind of um, have any more questions, then just post in the, um, the comments once the video is archived or, or continue to post now, and um, we'll do our best to kind of get through those as well. Um, and, of course, we'll, we'll be back again next week, um, same time, Friday, 1 o'clock, um, and yeah, that's it from us. Make sure you stay tuned to the Facebook page and the blog as well, where you'll get um, all the info about masterclasses, uh, Friday forum sessions, um, and course info as well. Um, so yeah, that's it from us. Just uh, say a big thank you to Anthony. Thank you today. so much. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Ooh. Cool.